Our next speakers are Chris Silvers and Taylor Banks. Taylor has spent 15 years in the information security area and has provided training for organizations such as the FBI, NSA, USA, U.S. Navy, and Marine Corps. Uh, Chris Silvers, you might see him around as a volunteer here in Nancy Village, <laughs> and he's also a DEF CON Black Badge winner. Uh, he has 20 years of experience in the information, in information security. So let's give him our attention. Their theme is On the Hunt, Hacking the Hunt Group. All right. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, you know, it's really difficult to, uh, to follow that last talk. Um, hence the reason there's actually empty seats in, in the audience, and which is really heartwarming, and, um, and I, I love to see it. There's a lot of people out there who are interested in ILF, um, and, and it's great to see. So um, cheers to you guys. Awesome. Definitely. Um, so, uh, so real quick, uh, yes, I am Chris Silvers, also known and, and usually normally known as Hannah's dad. Uh, if y'all know Hannah, she's back in the room and kind of running the room. And just a quick show of hands, um, who was actually here yesterday afternoon and heard Hannah's talk? Okay, about half and half. Okay, awesome. Do me a favor and find Hannah and give her some feedback, all right? She's, she's a young presenter, and she's always getting better, and the way she gets better is feedback. So we appreciate that. Um, and obviously, joining me, uh, Dr. Chaos himself, Taylor Banks. Party on, Taylor. Party on, Chris. <laughs> All right. So, whoop. okay. So let's let's mic the uh, mic the speaker here. Um, just a quick word. What you're about to hear was an actual telephone call on an actual penetration testing social engineering engagement. And I'm not going to say anything more. We'll explain a little bit later. All right. Thanks for calling. This is Joe. May I have your name, please? Hey, Joe. This is Mike on the front line. What on earth is going on? <laughs> <laughs> wow. We got the wow. exact same call at the exact same time. Oh, wow. That, that's weird. Yeah. That I, is bizarre. Are you, are, all right. So, to kind of explain what just happened and the context around it, Heather's going to tell us about a hunt group. All right. So, in, in telephony terminology, a hunt group, also called line hunting, is essentially a technology that is used when you call a call center. You call a single phone number, that phone number is distributed to a whole group of incoming lines. And I'll add a little bit to this for the purpose of our later discussion, but there's normally a couple of different distribution methods used by hunt groups. Uh, most frequently you'll find call centers use methods that are either round robin or circular distribution, or occasionally they will use most idle. The objective is to try to ensure that each new call that comes into the hunt group is distributed to someone else, right? So we've got a call center full of people. We want to make sure that when we call in, a new rep gets each call. This is why when you call your Comcast or or Fox or AT&T customer service line, if you hung up and called right back, you would speak to a different representative than you spoke to when you first placed the call. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> how are we here? Uh, my name is Taylor Banks, and I'm a freakaholic. So um, as a nine-year-old kid, thank you, as a nine-year-old kid in the 80s, I aspired to be the world's greatest computer hacker. I've never been arrested for a computer crime, so I'll leave it up to you to determine whether or not I achieved or didn't achieve my goal. Um, nonetheless, while also wanting to be the world's greatest computer hacker, I was rather fascinated with social engineering, uh, really often in form of basic phone pranking, right? I'm nine, it's the 80s, cut me some slack. So shortly after the advent of three-way calling, I discovered that I could connect multiple representatives at a call center together with a very brief delay by simply dialing a number, clicking over my receiver, and dialing the same number, and I would listen to the chaos that would often ensue. This was quite fun, and I started doing this with the Home Shopping Network. Why? I don't know. I guess it was the easiest target at the time. 
And what would happen is the rep would call in or I would dial the number and you'd hear ringing at both, both lines at the same time and somebody would answer and say, hello, this is Joe, would you like to buy the diamond? Now simultaneously the second line connects, so while Joe is answering this call, you also simultaneously hear, hi, this is Mary, would you like to buy the diamond? Now a couple of interesting things happened and that's what paved the way for what you're going to see here today. Number one, as I continued to do this, the representatives at the Home Shopping Network became more and more convinced that their phone systems were acting up. So they be began to expect phone flaws within their phone systems. I would continue to do this, oftentimes for an irritatingly long period of time, and at one point in time I actually heard two representatives set up a date. I'm not kidding, like the guy says, seriously, what, what call center are you, are you in? He says, I'm in Dallas. He says, stand up. He says, oh my God, I see you waving. So they go through this process, they're on the phone for like 10 or 12 minutes, and ultimately by the end of the call, they've set up a meeting that they're going to get together after work. So this was quite fantastic. <clears throat> Fast forward to 2011. I was listening to a presentation that Chris was giving at a local DC 404 meeting in Atlanta. What was the presentation? It's a uh, go with the flow. All right, I believe there are recordings of that online from subsequent conferences, and during that particular talk, Chris was playing back recordings from his social engineering engagements. As he's playing back these recordings, I'm sitting listening to the talk, and all of a sudden my nine-year-old brain, the only brain I've got, uh, pops up and says, oh my god, what would happen if we took this technique, if we took three-way calling, and we connected multiple representatives within a target company together? What might happen? What would ensue? So, <clears throat> In order to delve deeper into the topic, we also have to consider what, how would we use this method, how would we leverage this method to actually conduct a social engineering call? How would we use this to gather information that we could use during an engagement? There are a number of different things that we can use or get by leveraging this technique. Number one, it's great for reconnaissance. One of the interesting things that happened, <clears throat> and you'll see this live here momentarily, as I was going through this process, even so many years ago, as the representatives would get connected to each other and expect these connections, because again, they're convinced their phone system is acting up, they would talk very candidly. So they were speaking in language, they were using terms, they were talking very casually as if they were sitting next to one another, and in some cases they might actually have been. But unbeknownst to them, there was a third party on the line. So they're using terms, they're talking about things that they wouldn't talk about if they knew that somebody who didn't want to buy the diamond was also listening in on their conversation. So in addition to basic reconnaissance, we can potentially use this technique for credential harvesting. You'll hear some of this live. And further ponage. Chris? Yeah, so, um, so, so the concept here, and, and when I speak to people, uh, outside of the security realm and they they're like you know are you just nuts i mean because these are weird thoughts right these are not normal thoughts right but I, my term for it is called weaponization right that's everybody in this room probably has a pretty good concept of weaponization you take a process and you understand how it normally is supposed to work and then you think how could this process maybe abnormally work and then how could that be weaponized, right? That's what gets us going, right? That's what makes us work on weekends. So that's kind of the, the, the concept there. But what, what we have to understand is we have to transition that from a you know, evil genius type mindset. We have to have the evil genius mindset because that's where we get the weaponization concept. But then we have to transition it into, okay, but now how can we help our clients to protect themselves from the people who have that evil genius mindset but not the integrity we do, right? That's what we're all about. So fast forward to uh, 2017, last fall, I got this opportunity, had a client that I had been working with for several years and they had a really advanced security awareness program, very mature, and they also had a, a global call center uh, organization. So a huge call center. I mean, they probably had 400 employees total in their call center, and their call centers were even segmented into different specialties, right? So it was just a kind of a perfect storm type situation. But 
to actually convince the client to go for this because they never heard of this technique and they didn't know what was going to happen and what what information might end up you know being being spilled so to speak i had to sort of develop a more strategic and kind of business oriented methodology or strategy around this process right so essentially i laid out to them okay here's how it's going to work we're going to Start with Taylor's process of, uh, of doing the three-way calling just for some initial reconnaissance and then very quickly go to an initial injection where I'm going to pretend to be one of those agents, right? Maybe a new agent. Maybe I don't know a lot of the lingo, but I'm just going to fumble through and I'm not going to really press a lot and just kind of try to get a little bit more intelligence around their process, right? And then beyond that, then I'm going to actually kind of start, start asking some more innocent questions, but with a little bit more intelligence, finally starting to guide the actual conversation based on some additional information that I'm getting and start saying, well, gosh, should we do this or should we do that? Should we open a ticket? Should we call our boss? Should we, you know, and actually starting to make some suggestions and leading the other agent on the phone. Again, still pretending to be an agent. And then, of course, at some point, flipping it and going for exploitation, right? Because that's really what it comes down to. Any kind of penetration testing, you've got to get to an exploitation phase because that illustrates the impact of the risk that you're trying to explain to the organization so that they will then be able to justify mitigating that risk, right? All comes down to that. All right. So, with all that context, let's let's listen to some calls. Right? This first call is kind of the path, the, the initial injection, and just trying to, to pick up on some lingo. Right. So let's listen in here. I don't see you logged on. I'm 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 in exchange support. I mean, what well, is that support? Um, right. Um. Did you have a like? Was there another call a few minutes ago? Because I noticed one of my um, one of my coworkers received a call. Now the the telephone number that comes up in the call that I have from you right now is actually right. it's support. It's one eight hundred. So I was looking at this. I'm like, well, how how am I getting a call from us? Um, right. But uh, I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Uh, you know the the phone system that you're using. I mean, I, I have a, a desk phone that's right. you know, like a Polycom desk phone. Well, that's weird. I, 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 and this actually happened to be, like yesterday, um, I, I got like a call from Joe. He's, all, he's over on the phone side, the phone support side. Not something to mention to a uh, team captain and you know, maybe have uh, the PBX team look into it. All right. So, um, Everybody picked up on all those flags, right? I mean, this is like this is like live doing an SECTF. Sitting, it's just you don't have a bunch of people staring at you, which, by the way, is a lot easier. Um, so yeah, you pick up on Exchange support, Biz App support, Polycom desk phone. Uh, you know, the, the term team captain instead of supervisor, PBX team, all that good stuff. Now, did anybody happen to? Um, and by the way, just I forgot to mention. Uh, what you just heard were, was kind of a snippet of a call, right? I didn't, I didn't play the very first part and all that stuff, right? And, and a few of them are going to be that way. But, but uh, did anybody pick up on, on a, a red flag right away, right? Did you notice he said, I don't see you logged in? <laughs> yeah, oops, <laughs> right? Because I claimed to be from the same actual segment of their call center as he was. And so we should have been logged into the same area, right? Also bear in mind that, you know, looking at the strategy we laid out on a previous slide, at this point in time, Chris has already injected himself into the call. So you're not listening to two reps banter, you're listening to one rep who Chris is now impersonating another rep in order to gain the trust and confidence of this person he's speaking to. So as we pointed out, again, you know, doing this live, it's very likely, probable even, that you will have conducted several additional calls where you will have reps talking amongst themselves, providing some of this very same information. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you notice in the, in the early stages of that recording, you didn't hear me talking much. It was a little more him, right? 
right? All I did was just kind of say, hello, you know, thank you for calling so-and-so support. May I help you? And then he's the one that really kind of kind of prompted the, the uh, conversation, right? So the next phase there is to actually kind of go a little further and use what we've learned so far to, um, to then just prompt more, uh, more intelligence, right? And, and I, I haven't heard this term before, but we kind of came up with a folk sound, right? It's kind of an OSINT, but it's just voice instead of using online sources. All right, so let's hear the next one. Are, are you using the browser plugin? Because I'm, I'm using the soft phone. I am too. Yeah? Huh. Well, that's weird. I'm on my PC. Yeah, yeah, me, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. I, it, it, it is, I wonder if it it's happened before in the past. It has happened before and something with the hunt was weird. They sometimes the route calls weird. Right. Which which I But I use like three different it. browsers. It had nothing to do with the browser. I've got Chrome, I E N S K or uh, Firefox. Huh. Well that's strange. Are, are we supposed to report this or something to somebody or Nah. <laughs> it, it just happens. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Nah, it just happens. It just happens. You know how it is. Every now and then, right? So, yeah, this guy was this guy was actually hilarious. I, I would love to play the whole call because he was just, he was so funny. But uh, but yeah, so here we go. We pick up PC laptop, uh, hunt group, the, the whole term, which kind of prompted the, the name for the for the talk. Uh, and you know, and they're using all kind of browsers and obviously some old ones, right? That's okay. Nailed it, right? So then we get to the next phase, and this is where, this is where, yeah, thanks for the uh, Peter Griffin fans there. Um, this is where it actually gets fun, and it gets, you know, where you really start kind of, I won't say, like, controlling the conversation, because I seldom do that, but a little gentle nudging and a little guidance on, on this conversation. Influence. Um, yeah, just a little, a little nudging. So let's 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 see what happens when when I actually start kind of asserting myself using all this information that I've that I've gathered, right? Is anyone else on the line right now? Probably no. not. No, I yeah. guess not. It's huh. Strange. Yeah, well, that's weird. Yeah. I, are you using a PC or are you on a Polycom? I'm on both, actually. The call came through my Polycom, yeah. like a regular hunt group call, so I just huh. kind of just picked up. And I mean, well, there's account info here, but I don't, I don't know why right. it's there. The number's calling from our regular support phone number, though. Something's going yeah. on. Um, you're you're not on a Mac, are you? No, no, I'm on a no. regular okay. Windows Seven machine. Yep. Do you um, have any like customer info on your screen? No, no, I don't. Um, it came up and it was saying, you know, ask for customer ID, so or account ID. So, well, that's weird. Okay. Who's the supervisor over there? Because I, I'll get my team captain to, to get in touch with them. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so y'all, y'all heard me slip okay. up. I, I used the word supervisor and then kind of, you know, kind of, kind of gathered myself and said, "Oh yeah, who's the team captain? I'll, I'll get my, you know, team captain." Right. So of course, gathering a little more information, account info. I was on screen, the Windows 7, and, and his actual supervisor's name. So, you know, so now I'm really getting there to where I can say, oh, well, so-and-so's team captain, you know, Go Bob, said to do this. Let's now, this, this rabbit hole goes. Yeah, so, so now um, this next one's really fun. I don't, I don't really know what's fun. going on here. Um, you want to talk to tech support? Like, um, I, well, I, I guess so. I mean, I, I'm with the exchange group, the biz apps, but... Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, would it be, would I need to escalate that to voice services maybe? Or aren't they in charge of the next game? Or ISA, internal. Uh, hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. Like, I got the really weird. CX picture of your incoming call that says um, caller ID 800. And it says well, call from voice on, voice onboarding hunt group. Are, are you are are you a home home support or are you there in nope, the office? I'm working in the office. Huh, that's weird. Um, I mean, it happened. It happened at the beginning of my shift. Did you just come on or? No, I've been here since seven. Yeah, because uh, like I said, Troy, um, I think he said that he had just he had just logged on, and that was. I mean, you you hadn't logged off and logged back on or something, had you? Yeah, I just came back from lunch. I just logged back into the queue. Ah, uh, 
Okay. Well, that that might explain it. Um, it might be like when you first log in. Yeah. So, um, so are y'all recognizing some of the flags from the SECTF, right? The, the the employee schedule and lunchtime and those kind of things. Um, it really kind of ties it in, doesn't it? it? Those things are important, right? They definitely establish the rapport and the trust um, that that social engineers use on subsequent calls to kind of validate to the person, make them feel comfortable that you are an internal employee. But yeah, so so tech support is not necessarily called tech support. It's called ISA, which uh, I don't remember what ISA stands for, but I was able to, to find that out later and made a call into ISA just to report this problem, right? And then, and, and of course it was just totally bogus, right? And, and, but I gotta got the guy's name in ISA, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna hear in a minute, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention his name, right? Um, and, but you know, her office location and, and when she started, her lunch break and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, so at this point, this, this woman gave me so much information, I'm just like, Okay, if I don't if, if I don't go forward and, and pwn something, I, you know, I mean, come on, how how much can you how much information do you really need, right? So, this next call is actually going to play fr pretty much from the beginning of the call, right? So the other ones were sort of snippets. So now you're going to sort of hear the whole process up until the point where she where where um, uh, she confirms that she's actually run the executable that I'm asking her to run. <laughs> And, and then I, and then and then I'm going to cut the call because the rest of the call I was just kind of showboating. But anyway. What? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh no! Yeah. Well, it was just fun, you know. All right. So anyway, let's hear him. Thank you for calling. Thank you for calling. Onboarding. This is Tyson. May I have your name, please? Hi. I Hello. Think we must have Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think we must have gotten crossed because I'm with um, the advisor team, so I'm not sure why the call came through oh, to both of that's, us. That's weird. This, this is Tyson. I'm with, with uh, onboarding. Uh, the yeah, group that's... just showed up. Okay. I'm sorry. What was your name? Renee. Renee? And, yes. and who are you with, Renee? I'm with... Oh, with... Okay. Yeah. That, that's weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are, are you in voice or biz app? Okay. Yeah, the, the I, you know, okay. Well, okay. Well, that that's strange. Um, this actually this actually happened um, yesterday, but it was another onboarding call. So it was another onboarding tag. Um, okay. I, I I actually have a ticket open with ISA on it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I spoke with Howard. Um, did you? And he he wanted to find out. Are you using the the new next gen phone system, the upgraded system? No, I'm using the old system that I got like three years ago. Wow. Okay. So you're just using the Polycom instead of the browser plugin. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, do you have a few seconds? He um, he wanted me to gather some information because um, it seems this seems to be happening a good bit lately. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, so what? Uh, what kind of system are you? Are you on a Wise system or a laptop or? I'm on a Wise. Okay, you're on Wise, and and that's running Windows Seven, right? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. All right. And and uh, Renee, are you are you? Um, I guess you're in the office, right? Are you in? No, I'm a home worker. Oh, okay, home worker. All right. Okay, home worker. All right. And do you know if uh, so? Do you have Service Pack One on your on the Wise system? Um, I was just upgraded to the new uh, service pack. Um, okay. Is that is that showing service pack one? It should be um, should be build seventy six oh one. Um, only way for me to see that is if I actually log out. I believe I have to. Here it comes. Well, a actually, he said um, he said the easiest way to to um, to get this information. It's just to go out to um, .com, and that'll um, that'll do a quick inventory and show operating system and um, and, and software stuff. Software stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, .com. It's plural, I guess. This is a gaming. Website. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's just real easy. Um, there's a 
Uh, if you if you go to like my computer information, there's a um, there's a download called Detection that you can run, and it'll produce a report. My computer details. I do computer details. Right. Okay, I have service pack one, bill 7601. Yeah. All right, so are you on the advanced tab? Just or I was on basic. I put the advanced. Uh-huh. Right, yeah. Click on advanced and then scroll down, um, and then that'll show operating system, bill, and you said 7601, right? Yes. Uh-huh. I'm on Windows 7, Perfect. service pack one, bill 7601. Okay. Yeah. All right, so yeah, yeah, we I think we double confirmed that yeah. she ran the EXE. We're good, all right. Now keep in mind, I no, I did not have a reverse shell on her on her PC or anything. It was kind of not in the scope, but obviously, certainly could have very easily, very easily just owned that box right away. All right. So um, the. All right, so this next call um, didn't quite go exactly as planned. All right, and I just want to give the client some props here because, uh, believe it or not, they had some protections in place that sort of stopped me. Now, the call proceeded very much like that last call, up until the point where I had um, the employee going to the website. She was just about to download and run the executable, and this happened. And I want to my computer details. Then, yeah, my computer details. <clears throat> Oh, I can't run this. So it's asking me to run an executable. That's not something I can run. Right. I actually won't allow that, it. Yeah. That detection.exe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, he said. Oh, it won't let you run the executable? No, I'm, I'm not the admin here, so. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's strange. Um, okay. But let me. Okay. Yeah, he said if you get permission issues on the exe. Okay. Hey, Kathleen, what was your last name? All right, and you said you're in, um, I'm in Cloud Exchange? Uh, cloud Onboarding, Business Onboarding. All right, so I just had to collect a few other flags just, you know, just to kind of salvage the call. But, but the, the key there was that um, she wasn't actually able to run the executable because she didn't have administrative rights on her computer. Go figure, right? How about that? All right. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how this is how we can level up even from this basic test because this was kind of a first run of a pen test using this methodology, right? Um, and as Taylor said in the first place, was uh, you know he made he made what was it you told me like eighty five calls or something? Yeah. So so prior to the calls that you heard, I did a bit of research. Uh, I will point out both from and to states that only require single party consent. Uh, but I did some calls uh, to some well-known companies. I, I can pretty much guarantee that you are either a customer of theirs or they're a customer of yours if you're in this room. I'm not going to mention them by name, uh, but I did approximately 82 calls across just a couple of companies trying to test this technique. Now most of those calls were calls connecting call center reps to each other. And this is where things really do start to get interesting. You know, again, you saw Chris leveraging a lot of the information that he gathered during his own process, but a lot of that terminology that, you know, you won't even have to pry from your client because they're going to provide it to you the more times they connect to one another. A couple of things to bear in mind here, repetition is, it's an important component because it is the simple act of repetition that in essence creates the problem. Right, we want to simulate a phone system that's glitching. So the more that phone system glitches over and over and over and over again, the more the company is going to expect it. In this case, familiarity actually also tends to breed complacence. Right, so after you've gotten three or four crossed calls throughout the course of your workday, by the time that fifth call comes in, you think, oh God, not another one, who cares, whatever, and you let your guard down. And that's a lot of what we saw in these research calls. We saw people getting very casual with each other, using language that, again, they wouldn't use on a call with a customer. Is that me? Yeah, right. <clears throat> so um, this is the first thing, number one, repetition is important to help create the problem. 
Another thing that I found to be useful in doing some of my own basic injection and something that I would suggest as a, a method to use is also really to rely on deference, right? So say, you know, hey, uh, if you've connected a call and you've now got a call rep on the phone and all of a sudden you've got some pushback and they don't want to provide you with information or, you know, again, they're maybe questioning whether or not you are who you say you are, Oftentimes, one of the things that you will find is that you can get more information by pretending not to be the person who is ultimately responsible for this. Like, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to have to ask Bob. If you can't run that executable, my manager says there's probably another website we can send you to to get the information we need. Right? Rely on someone else or, or really use someone else to throw them under, under the bus for the information that you need to gather. Another thing that's very effective here is to use sympathy. Right? A lot of the folks that you're talking to on the phone, again, they're call center reps. So the more you can empathize with them and the more they can empathize with you, the more likely they're going to be to give you trust and information. So if while asking for information you get shut down or you get stopped, if you hold the phone away from your face and you go, oh my God, I'm going to get so fired. I can't believe this. It's the fifth time this has happened to me. Oh no. I really don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. yeah. I, I actually used this technique on, on a very recent um, uh, test where I just kind of, you know, like you say, just kind of go a little bit off the phone so that they, it sounds like you're talking to someone else and you, and, and you sort of say, yeah, she's saying she can't run the executable. Uh, you know, what, what's she supposed to, uh, so you want her to do what? Dude, I can't ask her to do that. Uh, really? Okay, okay. So, you know, he said, you know, go to a command prompt and type this and <laughs> even know what that means but you know you know he's he's saying type you know sys info how do you spell that man you know okay s y you know yeah and, and it works it's amazing that if you just kind of say I, I don't know i it's something crazy somebody else wants me to ask you to do and then they're I, like i don't really understand these systems very well to be honest with you i'm kind of new to all this stuff right yeah yeah i mean i'm a help desk guy like just like you right <laughs> you know so I'll add here also, this last bullet point is another important one, and this is something that I used in, in doing one of the earlier research calls as well. So after about the third or fourth call, connecting two representatives at this particular organization together, one of them mentioned the name of their internal ticketing system. Now admittedly, most of these people wouldn't know how and where to go about using this ticketing system to submit a ticket, but what I did is I immediately went out and registered that ticketing system name, support.com. So now when I ask them to go to a URL, I'm not asking them to go to some gaming site where they're going to download detection.exe. I'm asking them to go to a site that for all intents and purposes looks like it should be the system that they would expect to see. All right, so maybe it's a new domain, but it's got all the indicators that it's trusted, right? You use but, the right but name. Taylor, Taylor, reasonable domains like that would all would be taken up. Oh, of course you they know, would. Support type domains would be taken up. And yeah, even if they weren't, if they were available, there'd be thousands of dollars, wouldn't oh, yeah. they? Of course. You know, things like phone support.tel for $7.99. <laughs> I know it's a really high bar, but it lends a lot more credibility to the engagement. So again, you know, there are, there are subtle things you can do that also create context and that really reinforce the fact that you're a trusted individual, that you know the trusted systems, that you understand the internal processes. Hell, you understand the SOPs. You know the standard operating procedures for submitting this information. Where to go, what to type, what information is going to be needed. So when they go there, well, you've just done the same process. It's really easy for you to at least point them through the same thing. Exactly. So, bring us to the point. So, what, what do we do with this? What can we take away here as, as, a, as an educational um, benefit from this talk? So, first and foremost, to me, and, and, and I'm sure many of you in the room have been preaching this, least privilege. Quit giving your users admin access. They don't need it, especially their local machine. Even a help desk person likely does not need administrative privileges to their own machine. They administer, they may administer other systems. They may administer, you know, user permissions and Active Directory, but that doesn't mean that they need to have admin on their own machine, right? Um, and then of course, awareness. Now, um, Kathy, you still here? Yeah. Okay. So it, it, if anybody was here earlier for Kate's talk, um, the, the social engineering perspective from the CISO perspective, which by the way, I love that.
talk. Um, one of her key points was awareness is not a checkbox thing. It's not just laying a piece of paper in front of the employee and saying, you know, do you promise to be security aware? You it's mean actually I, a program. And it has just to be test out of awareness? Is yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, test no. out. Right. right. Yeah. It ha and it has to be customized to not only the organization, but the employee's role, right? Provide customized awareness to call center employees that's different than the C-suite, right? The C-suite doesn't need to know so much about this attack because it's not likely going to happen to them versus a call center employee where it is quite likely to happen to them. So making it role-based, making it customized, and, you know, and, and also encouraging that kind of evil mindset thought process that we sort of naturally have now so that employees can go out of the box and not, you know, not having to be trained specifically on every specific attack. And, and I right. think this is, there's something important to consider here as well because, you know, admittedly this is tough. Awareness is, is a challenge here because, you know, what we demonstrated today, this is a relatively novel technique at this point in time. Right, so most of the places that you're going to deal with aren't going to have had this done to them before. It's not like getting a spam email or a phishing email. So it's not something that you can easily just create an awareness program around. As Chris said, the key here isn't just helping people be aware that you know, two call center reps might get connected together. It's really awareness of you know, the, the need to not divulge information to people that you haven't vetted yourself, that haven't been verified. And so the awareness process here, again, it's not awareness of this particular individual three-way calling technique. Sure, that might make its way into a slide or a presentation, but it's really, again, about awareness about the challenge. What is it that we're trying to stop? What are we trying to prevent? And it's that dissemination of information that shouldn't get into somebody else's hands. Even the name of a ticketing system. Even the name that we use to refer to supervisors within an organization. Right, right exactly. And, and also the reporting. Um, another subsequent exercise um, where I kept repeatedly calling and setting up the three-way calling and, 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 oh, there must have been 100, 150 calls. No, nah, right? it just happens. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was the reaction from almost everybody. It was, no, nah, this just happens. We don't need to do a ticket on this. We don't need to report this, right? So I ended up actually having to call the supervisor of the, of the call center to press the issue to make it a problem. And I mean, it was over like 100 calls, right? And she, and she, she started spilling the beans about, yeah, we've been getting a lot of robo calls too. <laughs> like, oh, well, damn, there's an attack vector. Hmm, how can I do a robo call? Thanks, thanks for the tip, all right? Um, so there has to be that culture, right? That just, you know, that just red flag goes off and somebody says, well, okay, this is weird. Somebody needs to really actually look into this and, and make it happen. Um, and then, and then also, you know, making sure that that your staff, it, you know, has awareness of each other, and and you know has some familiar familiarity, because the toughest companies to test are the small ones where everybody knows everybody, right? <laughs> Everybody recognizes everybody's voice and all that kind of stuff. Again, this can be tough also when you're talking about large organizations. Sure. So, you know, a, a couple of the organizations that I was doing testing with, they have very large call centers. So the likelihood that somebody in one call center in one state is going to know another person in another call center in another state is probably not very likely. But this is also, this kind of begets the next point, this is why it's important to have verification processes in place. Right, so if I say, oh yes, well that's funny, it's been happening to me all day too. I'm, I'm Bob, I'm over in BizApp support. You want the person on the other end of the line say, oh is that right Bob? What's your user, what's your account ID again? Hold on, let me look you up in the system so that I can make sure you know, we're having an appropriate conversation about this topic now that we've received this particular call. Yes. yes. <laughs> right, so you see the hole in Absolutely. that, right? Which, which means you then have to level up, right? This is a cat and mouse game, right? We're just kind of losing it, right? And, and once again, that leads to the next bullet point is test, 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 right? Because it's not a specific attack when it comes right down to it. It is a category of attacks. It is just the concept of you could be attacked. You could be a target, right? And the whole concept of dispelling that false sense of security that, that people walk through life with, right? We, we've, got to, we've got to ingrain that, that, um, that uh, 
through multiple examples that people just had start having that kind of feeling of I'm this is kind of sounding a little weird this is a little sketchy to me right okay. and they start getting that feeling and then they report it and and they're rewarded for that and let's be honest this is exactly why we do this type of thing in a pen test right because what would somebody in your organization give away what would somebody tell somebody on the other end of the phone if the person on the other end of the phone sounded exactly like them, was having the same problem, they could empathize with, they knew the verbiage, they knew the lingo, they knew the process. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you know, again, they already have all of the information. So this is exactly why we do this in a pen test. This is exactly why we do these things in social engineering engagements. Because again, what would really be exposed if you don't know what your employees or if your clients don't know and understand what their employees are willing to give away the moment they believe somebody on the other end of the line works for the same company. Yeah. So, um, so that's what we got. Um, I appreciate your attention and your time. Uh, we have a couple uh, minutes for questions, I believe. Just a few minutes. Yeah. Yes, right over here. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when, when, when you were doing this three-way calling, right, were you actually spoofing on, on both? Are you talking about when Taylor was doing it or with me? Yes. Because, yeah. Yeah, I was. I was using a service that spoofed the number so that when I was calling, the number was identical to, to the number that I was calling. So it looked like same the number was being placed to and from the same telephone number. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, any other questions? What the client say? Um, yeah, they were a little. The um, question was, what what was my client's reaction to this? Um, well, yeah, he um, he he was kind of like, so what do we really do about this? And I mean, it, it, it was a long conversation about how to mitigate this risk because it was almost like every suggestion that just kind of popped in my head. He was like, yeah, I don't think that's going to work because of this. It's like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge for sure. Um, other questions? Anybody? Oh, yes, sir. The best way you can do what? Customize training. What are the best ways you can customize yes. training for okay. an organization? Right. To, so, to, to feed yeah. Yourself? What are the best ways you? Cut? Okay. So, this kind of um, refers back to Kate's talk as well, uh, which I'm sure was recorded, so you can watch it later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be honest, uh, I think that you start with a good platform, right? Like um, some, some of those that she mentioned, the, the no befores and the fish me or whatever. But you've got to realize that, um, that those platforms are good and they will help you uh, to increase efficiency of the program, but not necessarily effectiveness. So that um, you can leverage that automation to then take all that time you saved because you automated the basic awareness, you take that time that you saved and that money you saved and you pour it into customized, whether it be face-to-face -face or online interactive um, training that is truly customized not only to the organization but the role that people are playing and test. I'm going to add a, a similar answer to that as well, and that's also that you, you need to train people to be suspicious, right? So ultimately, that's a big part of this, is anytime somebody's asking for information that they should already have, again, this is almost kind of the oxymoron in this scenario, is when somebody calls and they appear to be from the same company, why are they asking of what operating system I'm using and what service pack? In a sense, ironically, I kind of trust them more because, again, they've identified themselves as being another employee, they've used the lingo, why wouldn't they be telling the truth? But we have to kind of train people to be at least suspect. This actually goes back to Hannah's talk yesterday. She was talking about memes, right? And, and why is it that people, they, they want to know, you know, what month they were born in and the street that they lived on in order to determine, you know, what, what kind of pretty princess they're going to be. You should be suspect of that, right? When somebody asks for that type of information, your client should say, huh. Yeah. Why, why should I be providing this information to the caller on the other end of the line? And that's something you yeah. can't train, you know, technically it's not the details, it's the process, the thought right. process. Right. And um, I know the, the military has that term situational awareness, right? 
does does the question you're being asked really and truly fit the situation you're in, right? Well, maybe maybe not, right? Yeah. How do you stop complacency? I, you know, you, okay, get out of my brain. You're, you were like, this is my next thought. So, um, because the other, the other side of that as well is something that Chris, preach, Chris Hadnagy preaches all the time, is making sure that employees understand the value of the information that they have in their brains, right? Because complacency is, you know, Oh, well, is it really that important that, you know, that I know the name of our internal ticketing system? You know, because they deal with it every day and they just don't see the importance. And part of that education and awareness is the fact that, yes, that is important information. You are important as an employee. You have sensitive information that is valuable to an attacker. So we're relying on you to protect that. It's dangerous. You know, we need your help. You're valuable. I would also say early detection, because part of what creates complacency was I did 82 calls, right? So the employees, they, they weren't complacent on call three. They were actually still suspect. It was call 19 and call 23 and call 25, where finally the reps were like, good God, this can't be a scam. I've talked to seven people in my own team, you know? So who's this other guy? Bob called yeah. Right, so again, complacency, complacency comes because by not having early detection or by not having processes in place, we're able to do this enough times to where it's just, it's too believable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get off my call. I'll yeah. give you my password, keep calling. <laughs> yeah. All right, All right. A question back here. Um, okay, so the, the question is, obviously, we're, we're making a lot of calls and we're tying up the, the time of, of these customer service agents, and, and so did that impact the productivity of the company? And, um, and yeah, you're right, it, it does, um, but that's, that gets into the project management aspect of you know, penetration testing that there's always, and you want to make sure the client understands what's going to happen. As much as you can. I mean, you can't predict everything. Um, but just like you know, if if a um, when, when we do you know technical penetration testing, we make sure that the client understands that there's always a chance that we might down a box, right? I mean, and I usually use the example of of you know if they've got an AIX box or an old Solaris box or H pucks, you know, if you if if it's that important to you that that box not suffer any degradation, then let's leave it out of scope, right? I'll, I'll also add that, you know, I made every effort to try to do this in a very ethical manner, because my objective was not to compromise these companies, it was really to, to vet this idea. So I did this across the span of a relatively, I don't want to say long period of time, but this was across multiple days. Um, and I, I did make every effort not to keep reps on the phone, and then the other thing is, I didn't ask anybody to do anything. Um, I did on a couple of occasions just interject a little bit. I did pop in to you know, convince somebody again that maybe there was an audio glitch or there was somebody there. But for the most part, my objective was how can I get these people talking? And you know, how many calls will it take before their guards are let down? I will say one of the calls uh, became a rather long call. On, on one, of the, uh, one of the pairs of people that I matched together, they happened to be assistants to executives at this particular organization, and they sat on the phone for almost 45 minutes discussing plans for the Christmas party and locations of travel for these particular ex executives. So admittedly, that was rather revealing information. It's also why you don't get to hear those calls here today. Um, but, but then again, that, that was probably pretty productive for them. I, hey, you know, they, were, they were coordinating the Christmas oh, party, sure, right? That's I, important stuff. Right? Exactly. I, I know exactly what Susan was going to be taken to that party. So, you know, ultimately, again, my objective during the research phase was to try to do this as responsibly as I could, considering that this wasn't an engagement, that this was indeed just, you know, research phase, and I was trying to operate both within legal limits, but I, again, my objective wasn't to, to hurt, but to, to, again, demonstrate, does this work? And I think across the, the sequence of calls that I did before this became a strategic process, Conclusively, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I, <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So, I, so I think I think we have yeah time for one last question right up here in front.
Yeah. That, yes. <laughs> that, that is a very good question. In fact, um, so the question was, does, does a lot depend on um, the nature of their hunt group, the, 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 how their hunt group works? In fact, uh, a subsequent engagement, um, they had this menu system and, you know, you had to navigate the menu system before it even got into the hunt group. And, um, and then there would be hold music. Uh, you know, so you, you got to kind of picture this as you're making two phone calls simultaneously, right? It's, it's also partly skill. I, I just connected a couple of reps together manually and had success right, on a couple of right. occasions, too. So, so when, when the phone system didn't yeah. work for me, I just dialed people direct. Right. So, but there were several situations where one, one rep would answer while the other call was still playing hold music. And so I could hear them, right? And they would say, you know, hello, you know, you know, thank you for calling, blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, you know, there's music playing. So I would have to interject, hello, hello, and just so that they would know someone else was until the whole music stopped and the other agent answered, right? So there is a little finagling to do, but um, anyway, uh, good question. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot.